Hey, welcome to episode 20 here on Disciple Making Disciples. I'm Pastor Craig. We're so excited about what God's going to speak to us today. And uh, I'm going to talk in this episode 20 in conjunction with episode 22. We're going to come back in two weeks and finish this teaching today. But I want to talk to you today about the Holy Spirit's anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I spoke a couple weeks ago about the difference between His anointing and our integrity. I want to talk about the purpose of the anointing. We know that we can't do ministry apart from the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We know that this programs and plans and models and styles of ministry today, at the end of the day, you know, we've got to come to a point and realize that it's His church, it's His fruit, and it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's so needed in today's generation. And so today I want to talk out of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the prophet, about the purpose and the, the four points, and we'll hit two of those today on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, I love God's Word. I want you to turn with me, if you have your Bible, to Isaiah chapter 45. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation today. And the Bible says this in Isaiah 45, verse 1 through 3. This then is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed one, whose right hand he will empower. Who? God will empower. The Bible says this is what the Lord says to Cyrus. You say, Craig, who was Cyrus? Now, Cyrus, this was written years before Cyrus ever lived. This was written in about the 5th century B.C., about the, almost the 6th century B.C. when the book of Isaiah was written. And this was written years before Cyrus ever lived. Now Cyrus was the king of the Medes and the Persians. And Cyrus on one occasion went in one night and he overthrew the most powerful kingdom ever, the kingdom of Babylon. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar that night he was overthrown and the greatest, most powerful kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, was overthrown by this king of the Medes and Persians named Cyrus. The Bible says that this is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed one, whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear. Their fortress gates will be open, never to shut again. Now notice this is God prophesying way in advance. He's not predicting something that he hoped would happen. He was prophesying something he knew would happen. And so when you speak and when God speaks and he speaks something that he already knows about, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's going to take place because God has the energy and the resource behind the one who says it to make it happen. And so God is predicting this and he said, this is what the Lord says. I will go before you, Cyrus, and I'm going to level the mountains. I'm going to smash down gates of bronze. I'm going to cut through bars of iron. And he says, I'm going to give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. I would do this so that you, Cyrus, know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, the one who calls you by name. Now, the Bible says in verse 2 that he was going to go into Babylon and tear alive this kingdom. Now, Babylon, you got to understand, was the greatest city in the world. Uh, it, they, they say, histor historians say that it had a perimeter defense system like the wall of China. The wall of Babylon was 37 miles around in circumference. They said you could get four chariots side by side and ride on top of the wall. That is a big wall. 37 miles around just, just in, uh, in, in, with a circumference to protect this great city. And inside the wall, once you got inside the wall, uh, there, would, there, would be, there was no comparison to the gates of Babylon. Many other gates would be wooden. They could break through, but not so with the gates of Babylon. They were made of bronze. And you thought, man, I could get through the gates. I'm going to be there. But once you broke through the gates of bronze, then you came to iron bars, the Bible says. They had these big bars of iron that was impossible. And so what was impossible for anybody to do, how many of you know that God's anointing on Cyrus made it possible? And from the very on in this story, you can realize that God can do things that are impossible. And the natural things that are impossible, that by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, King Cyrus could do the impossible. It's almost as if God was stating in Isaiah 45 that my anointing is greater than anything that man can devise. My anointing is greater than any war machine man can devise. My anointing is greater than any wall you can try to put up. My anointing is greater than that. And so what you've got to understand today, friend, is that you, once you've been called out of darkness, that God wants to put His anointing on you to do the work of ministry. And a lot of times we think we're like the second best or the scrubs. There are no scrubs in the kingdom of God. We're all first string playing on the field. We're on the court. We're part of the starting five. I mean, John 2 says this, that Jesus saved the best for last. See, a lot of people think that, oh yeah, the prophets and the apostles, they were the best, God's best on the field. Now He's just left it up to us as scrubs to kind of finish it out. That's not the case. John chapter 2 Jesus saved the best wine for last. And, and he saved us in our generation for what God's trying to accomplish in this time. And we got to understand that. That's why the enemy hates this generation. That's why there's been 50 million babies aborted alone in America. Because the enemy does not want God's best on the playing field. we got to realize that once we've been called out of darkness, that's not just good enough. Now we've got to be anointed so that God can display his goodness 
through us. He can display His glory through us. And you got to realize today, friend, you're watching this video, there's something different about you when the anointing of God comes on you. And God wants to put His anointing on you to bring you to the pinnacle of your destiny. I mean, mediocrity is mass-produced, but destiny is custom-designed. And God's got a custom-designed purpose for you. And that's why His anointing comes upon your life. The Bible says that the reason the Son of God was manifest was to destroy the works of the devil. God wants to use you and I to destroy the works of the devil. And that's how we're going to be used, and that's why He wants to anoint our lives. Isaiah 61, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, the anointing to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, how many of you know if Jesus needed the anointing, how much more do we need the anointing? And He did nothing without the anointing. A lot of people say, well, He was the Son of God. Yeah, but He emptied Himself, Philippians 2 said, and He did nothing without the anointing, showing us that the same way that He walked in the anointing, that we also could walk in that same anointing. 1 John 2.20 says, but you, not preachers, pastors, teachers, but you, all of us have received an anointing from the Holy One, and we knew, know all things. We all have received an anointing. So I want to give you two things about the anointing, because the anointing is a mark of favor on your life. Number one is that your anointing is for a purpose. Let me say that again. Your anointing is for a purpose. The moment you were saved, His anointing came upon you. God has anointed me for a purpose. It is a position. It's not for me to sit on my couch at home and be a potato and be lazy and apathetic and lethargic my whole life. The anointing comes upon me to do the work of God, the work of ministry. And now that anointing that comes on me is for a purpose, and then that purpose aligns me with a position. But the position in ministry never comes until the anointing for the purpose comes on you. So the anointing of the purpose of God comes on somebody's life, and then they move into a position to fulfill that purpose. And a lot of times people think, man, I'm so timid, but when you step out into your purpose, it's the anointing of God that meets you when you step out into your purpose. It's not until you step into the purpose of God for your life that the anointing comes on you. When you step out by faith and holiness, that, that, that previous anointing that God has placed in your life, it's there. It's there to supernaturally empower you. And, you know, God not only knew Cyrus' purposes years before, but he also, he also gave him anointing to make this happen, to overthrow the kingdom of Babylon. Now, I want to read for you Exodus chapter 30. Because the anointing really serves as a twofold purpose. Exodus chapter 30, listen to what the anointing does, verse 26 through 30. The Bible says, Use this sacred oil to anoint the tabernacle. Now, anytime you see oil in the Old Testament, it's indicative of the, new, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. He said, Use this sacred oil to anoint the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and all its accessories, the incense altar, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and the wash basin with its stand. He said, consecrate them to make them absolutely holy. And after this, whatever touches them shall become holy. Jesus in the mountain of transfiguration, the glory of the Lord transfigured him. And not only was he beaming radiant glory, but his clothes were as well. Because anything that touches the anointing becomes holy. It becomes holy in that moment. Now, there's really two purposes for the anointing. Number one, the anointing, there's an anointing for objects. The Bible says that there was anointing on this house in Exodus chapter 30. There's an anointing on the house that rests on the house. I believe there's an anointing on churches that, that rests, the anointing for deliverance on churches. But then there's an anointing on certain ministries. The Bible says anoint the table. What is that? We anoint the table because churches are anointed to preach the gospel. He said, these also, you need to take this oil and you need to anoint the lampstand. Craig, what's that? The lampstand's indicative of prayer. There are houses that are anointed for prayer. You look at IHOP and the prayer ministry that goes around the United States, they are anointed for prayer. So the first anointing is for objects. And then secondly, the thing about the anointing is that everybody in the house is anointed to serve. Listen to verse 30 of Exodus 30. He said, anoint Aaron and his sons also concerning them and consecrating them to serve as priests. Everybody in the body of Christ is anointed to serve as priests. Now you got to understand something. In the Old Testament, the anointing was for two types of people. It was for priests and for kings. The priests were anointed and then the kings were anointed. That is a prophetic picture of Jesus who is anointed as our priest. He's the priest and he's also the king of kings. And what that means is that God intends for all of us to be anointed, number one, as priests to minister to the needs of people. And then number two, we're anointed as kings to rule and reign with Christ. Let me say it again. We are anointed, number one, as priests to meet the needs of people. You're anointed in your church to serve the people in your church. Number two, you're anointed as a king to rule and reign with Christ one day and upon this earth. That's the purpose. That's what the anointing of God's for. It's not for you to take yourself. And when His anointing comes on anything, what was common becomes uncommon under the anointing of God. What was of no value becomes of highest value when the anointing of God comes upon it. 
What was natural becomes supernatural when God's anointing comes upon him. The anointing takes something and someone ordinary and it makes them someone extraordinary for Christ. That's what the anointing of God does. And every person, every ministry is ordinary until the supernatural anointing of God comes upon it. Don't ever get that confused. It's his anointing. It's the anointing of God that is on us for a purpose. Now the second reason the thing or point I want to bring from Isaiah 45 is not only the anointing's on us for a purpose, but number two, the anointing brings supernatural empowerment. Said again, the anointing brings supernatural empowerment. Go back to Isaiah 45 with me. The Bible says in verse two, he said in verse one, this is what the Lord says to Cyrus, whom is his anointed one, one whose right hand he will empower. Now, Craig, what do you mean? You know, a lot of times we think of Cyrus, you know, as kind of being like this World War, I mean, this uh, WWF star who's like, you know, uh, this big, this big, huge wrestler, and he's got these big, huge arms, he's got these pecs that look like planters outside of windows, you know, he's got this huge, big thighs and these legs that he could just, you know, just wear people out with, but I think that Cyrus was an ordinary fella, I mean, like Samson, he was an ordinary fella. But he could do what no one else could do because the anointing supernaturally empowered him. The Bible says that Samson did impossible things. The Spirit of the Lord would come upon him in the Old Testament and then it would lift. Now what's so amazing to me about this passage is that in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God came upon somebody, it would come upon them for the work of what they had to do, God to accomplish, and then it would lift. But that was before the Christ. That was before the cross. Now he's living inside of us, the Holy Spirit. We've been empowered. And that was before the veil was torn. Now the Spirit doesn't come upon us. It rests inside of us. That's the difference in the New Testament. Acts 1 and 8, Jesus said, Stay in Jerusalem till you're clothed with power from on high. Then you'll be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In other words, Jesus was saying to the disciples, Don't do anything. Don't try to even go out there and do anything until my anointing comes upon you or it's going to avail to nothing. It will amount to nothing. And, and, and when the anointing came upon Peter, think about this. Peter who was afraid to even say he knew Jesus in front of a, a slave girl beside a fire one night, just 50 days later, under the anointing of God, preached to over 3,000 people and they gave their hearts to the Lord. What changed in 50 days? Nothing except the anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon Peter. The anointing calls this guy who wouldn't even testify Christ to all of a sudden preach with boldness and 3,000 people came to Christ with a bold declaration. See, the anointing is for a purpose and it brings supernatural empowerment. That's why, friend, I don't care if you've had the roughest week of your life. I don't care if you're going through the hardest season of your life. You have no reason to be depressed and discouraged by the devil. The enemy should be scared of us because the anointing of God's inside of us. The presence of the living God that's in us is overpowering. Jesus said, take heart for I've overcome the world. He's already Already overcome and he said he's gonna make us more than conquerors you know what that means it means once you've already conquered your own issues and sin then you help other people become more than a conqueror how can you be more than a conqueror by helping other people overcome and conquer the issues in their own life and the devil fears us because the anointing of God that's sent inside of us David you remember this the ruddy faced 16 year old the Bible said because of the anointing that he walked in he walked in confidence because he knew it wasn't him and he walked up with five stones and he knocked down the giant because the anointing of God it's not by might nor by power Zechariah 4 6 but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts this 16-year-old ruddy-faced boy took down a nine-foot Goliath because he was a seasoned warrior, Goliath was, but he came down under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we've got to realize that his anointing comes upon us for a purpose. We are anointed for a purpose, he said, of whose right hand I will empower. We've got to realize that. The same power that resurrected Jesus now lives inside of us. His anointing is upon us. And you and I were born to be wild, man. We weren't born to live these just American lifestyles that are just uh, full of American dream that are safe and westernized. And don't let the church and anybody else try to try to compromise your passion and say, oh, you'll grow up one day. Don't ever let the fire and the passion of God that's in your belly ever go to rest. You always keep that deep down inside of you and realize that God's put His Spirit inside of you to do something phenomenal for the kingdom of God. Not do something insignificant, do something phenomenal. And you can't do it except be by the Spirit of God. You can imagine the way back in the Bible when God, He breathed into Adam the breath of life. And when Adam opened his eyes for the first time, God's mouth had just been on his nose. 
and he saw his creator for the first time. And the, the breath of God that's in his lungs is the very breath that was just in God's lungs. And that's the same for you and I, that he is breathing us. In him we live and move and have our being. And we've got to realize we are made in the image of this untamable, powerful God. It's not a westernized, cute little lifestyle just to get through and get to retirement and kind of spend the rest of my life. No, we have a purpose. You have a purpose. You're destiny bound. I, and I feel this today. God's got his hand on your life and our generation for a purpose. And it's his anointing that, that, that comes upon us. You're not just a product of circumstance. You're not just a product of family. God has called you and you are made in his image. And, and it wasn't like when Adam woke up, he was like, okay, God, what is your will for my life? No, he was like, God, you've got this story going on. And now where can I be used in this story? Where can I be used? And God's like, yeah, come over here. I'm going to let you name all these animals. And it wasn't like, God, I'm here. What is your will for my life? No, God was like, I've already got this story and I want you to be a part of it. And God's got that for you and this generation. And the Bible says in John 10, he came that we might have life and life to the full. Not survival, not just to survive the world, but to thrive in the world. And God leads you. He's the good shepherd into full life. That's what his anointing does. As many are led by the Spirit of God or sons of God, Jesus said in John chapter 8. We've got to, we've got to take on the anointing for a purpose and realize it empowers us. And then when we move in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you become like Peter who just shadow touched people and it healed them. Can you imagine today people putting on the sidewalk and they just waited for a, a man of God, a woman of God to walk by and their shadow touch them and they get up and walk. Can you imagine the anointing of God that was on Peter? Why? Because he was willing to pay the price. He went to hell and back. I'm like, when I read that in the New Testament, I'm like, God, get me there. I want to be there. That's, that's what I want to be. I want that kind of anointing on my life. How does it happen? Well, you got to be willing to be baptized with the suffering Christ was baptized with. you got to be willing to say, I'm going to get in the Word of God. you got to be will, uh, really willing to say, God, I'm going to go to hell and back, but once I go to hell and back, what's five more yards? There's a price to be paid for the anointing. God says in His Word that the Spirit of the Lord is upon you to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, the Bible says. Listen to this, Isaiah 61. To preach the gospel to the poor, to heal up brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know what that means? The anointing is to given to preach the gospel of the poor. It's given to help, uh, help and restore people. It's given to help proclaim freedom to the captives. It's given to help open blinded eyes. It's given to set people free in deliverance. And the anointing finally flows in God's timing, and it proclaims God's timing to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the anointing that's upon your life today. And I want to pray for you today as we close episode 20. We're going to come back in episode 22, talk about the last two points out of Isaiah 45. But let me pray for you today. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to teach into the hearts and lives of people. Lord, literally not around just the United States, but around the globe. And I just pray that today, God, wherever these people are at, Lord, that the Spirit of God would touch their hearts. I pray, Father, that you would speak to their lives. I pray, Father, they would realize with encouragement today, God, that you are breathing your life into them. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead is exerted in their own lives, God, and your anointing's upon them to do what you've called them to do. May they understand the calling of God, the constraint of God on their heart. And I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would bless them mightily, God. Open up doors of opportunity opportunity that no man can close, God, and open and close the doors that no man can open. Let them walk in the prophetic destiny of God for their life in this season. And we thank you for your anointing that breaks the yoke in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week for episode 21.